Welcome to the Future Tech Podcast. I'm your pilot, Nolan Michaels. What do you think of the new setup? Trying something a little new. I got this digital picture frame and unfortunately it doesn't look that great on camera. It's a lot better in person, but hopefully it gives you something to look at while um, talking about nonsense. I think there's a few things that don't need to be talked about, but have kind of come to my attention in the last week. Maybe the first little funny thing I can mention is that I find the names of these new AI to be so strange, and mainly I'm talking about Bing and ChatGPT and Google Bard. Like, what? (laughs) On the eve of mankind's biggest change, those names were chosen. Like, what's up with that? You know, like, 10 years ago, Siri came out, and Siri, like, was a human name, but maybe a little unconventional, and that made it stand out. And then Alexa came around. And I'm sure there was a lot of Alexas out there that are like, wait, what? Why? Why did it have to be my name? Like Amazon could have chosen anything. They went with Alexa. That's fine. I definitely thought that trend would continue, but it didn't. We have chat GPT. Like, where's Greg? Like, oh, just think about how different things would be if they had named it after a human. Like, oh, have you been talking to Florence? Do you use Florence to help you with work? And like any name I say would is just a silly suggestion. It's no better than Alexa. Like, where's Ricky? Ricky GPT. Oh, we uh, developed a new AI assistant for you. His name is Carl. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Why GPT? Why chat GPT? Why Bing? But I guess Sydney is Bing's code name behind the scenes. Still strange that they didn't, you know, go with Sydney. They didn't go with a name. And Google Bard. I really wonder why these more technical terms, well, Bing and Bard aren't technical, but why they moved away from anthropomorphizing the AI. It's really interesting. Why do you think they did it? Is it an oversight or is it strategic because if these things were named, if Bing introduced Sydney to the world, would that only exacerbate the problem of people becoming attached in a weird way? Like, I don't think anyone's going to fall in love with Bing, but Sydney might get you thinking about things. And maybe the name is just the first step, but it's a giant step towards developing a relationship with something. And at these early stages, I'm sure the conversations were had about whether it's appropriate to give human names to these systems. The fastest growing software of all time, ChatGPT. I can't believe it doesn't have a name. And maybe, I think I would argue, that its name holds it back from growing even faster. And if you're already the fastest growing of all time, do you really care how much faster you could be? I don't know. But I think it's a marketing dilemma where, you know, the name of your product means everything. Or a bad name means everything. Like, just think of a bad word, and if that was the name of a company, it's not going to do well. But honestly, if GPT was called Maurice or Monica, I don't know, no matter what, instead of saying, hey, did you hear about chat GPT? You know, like when you when I talk to my mom about it, I call it a chat bot, and then she knows which one I'm referring to, which is GPT. But if it was just a name like, hey, I was using Monica for a YouTube description yesterday and she really helped me out. And maybe that's the issue when giving it a name. Not only do you not want to make it appear human, but right now it doesn't have a voice. Siri and Alexa have voices, as far as I know. Maybe you can change the voices and change their accents. And you could probably make Siri a guy. Probably. Don't quote me on that. I don't have an iPhone. But maybe these companies have avoided a human-like name in order to avoid the gender dispute. Like, you're talking to chat GPT. It's definitely not a human. It might talk like a human, but it's definitely not a human. It's definitely not a boy or a girl. And maybe the marketing departments of these companies had to decide that, like, hey, we're not ready to do a full blitz right now. Like, I don't think these things are being marketed. They're not advertised. It's a lot of word of mouth. They're in beta. You know, they're just testing the limits of what these systems can do. So maybe they weren't prepared for a bunch of commercials 
with a given voice. Yeah, I think that's it. You, you don't want to make it a boy or a girl, but you know, I'm just thinking out loud. That's a really easy marketing problem to solve. You just have chat GPT running with a bunch of different voices and a bunch of different faces. And you just say in the commercial that chat GPT is everyone. It's everything. And maybe you name it something a little unconventional like Siri, a gender neutral name. You know, it's really hard to know from the outside, but any problem you can think of, there's definitely solutions. And I just find it interesting that Google, Microsoft, and OpenAI all came to the same conclusion, which was to stick with like a very unattractive name. Bing AI, Bard, ChatGPT, like why did they not romanticize it? And it's so interesting because that's what making money is all about. That's what capitalism is all about. And these companies know that they're so good at it. I don't want to think too much about it. I just do find it strange that these amazing, amazing services were released with such lackluster branding. Maybe that's what I'm getting at. Brand recognition. Chat GPT. It's got to be one of the worst names ever. Like, think of search engines. Like, okay, Google. And then Google became part of the lexicon. Everyone knows what a Google is to Google something. But then 20 years ago, you know, we had Ask Jeeves, which was this like personality in the search engine. Obviously, it didn't have a personality, but Jeeves was still, it was a part of the plan to get people to use that platform. Ask Jeeves. How has Bing and Google Bard like not, not run with that strategy? I don't know. Okay, let's move on. What else do we got? Let me tell you a quick story about why I find this emergent technology so interesting. I do understand why some people just continue about their day and let the world evolve around them. That's fine. But what makes me stop and care so much is that I have a lot of memories from before technology, from before the internet. And I'm not that old, but life used to be so different. And I feel like you'd be crazy not to acknowledge all the change. And maybe the one story that comes to mind is something my dad used to tell me about. Like the first time he saw a colored TV, you know, you used to watch Leave It to Beaver and The Three Stooges, the news, everything was black and white. And then one day it wasn't. The world turned to color. And I can remember him telling me about, you know, the first time seeing different sports teams and the colors on their uniforms, the jerseys that they would be wearing. And like not knowing that this is just an example that the Lakers wore yellow and purple, gold and purple. Like, you know, you'd watch them on TV and you had no idea what their uniforms look like. And then one day you did. But the funny one is that even before everything got fully turned into color, my dad would tell me about this, like <laughs> this little screen that they bought from the store and it had three colors on it. And then you would put the screen on top of your TV. So like it was divided into thirds. So the, the upper third was blue, you know, like the sky. The middle was, I, I don't even remember what the middle was. Probably just like, you know, a random color, maybe brown or something. I don't even know what the middle was. But the bottom was green for grass. And you would put this over your TV. And, and my dad would tell me that like, oh, it was the most amazing thing he'd ever seen. He couldn't believe how cool it looked. And like just explaining it, you can picture how awful that would actually be. But to go from black and white to any bit of color, that's a core memory right there. And, you know, you hear that in the 90s and it's hard to imagine. And then, you know, high definition gets introduced. And I remember when high definition first came out, I wasn't really impressed with it. I didn't see what the big deal was. I had no problem watching standard definition hockey. It didn't seem like a big deal to me. And my brother agreed. We didn't understand why my dad cared so much. Of course, he was right. And after you watch HD for a little bit, you can't go back. You can't go backwards. Your eyes have like adjusted to this new world. And anytime you go to watch standard definition, you can't even remember what it was like to enjoy it. Like your brain can't process that lower amount of information anymore. And it's always so fascinating because before high definition, standard definition was no problem. Nobody had any complaints because you didn't know any better. What are you going to complain about? But as soon as you see something that's better, like your brain kind of adapts on the fly and you can't go backwards. It's so interesting. And maybe you can go backwards. I think if you were to watch 
standard definition on a bad TV nowadays. Maybe it would take you a week, maybe it would take you a month straight of watching this bad footage, but I think you'd get used to it. I don't see why you wouldn't, but it's certainly jarring and it's certainly not easy to go. Like even if you're on YouTube right now and you change the quality to 420 or 480, what is it? Whatever, 140. Like you can lower the quality on a YouTube video very much and it's not only unrecognizable, but it's unwatchable because you've seen what's better. And I think that still happens to this day where, you know, if you show chat GPT to someone, they're going to think it's the greatest thing in the world. But there are people who used GPT when it first came out. And there are people who used Bing, especially when it first came out, that now think these products are lackluster because they've been nerfed just a little bit. The resolution has been slightly reduced and you could call it censorship or whatever but these companies needed to constrain their ais a bit because they released it on the world and they saw what the world did with it and they're like oh no we cannot have these ais saying these things so they reduced the quality of it and now the people who had the high quality can barely use the new versions because it's lower to them but for everyone else who didn't get that chance like i never got to talk to bing i heard stories it, it sounded amazing. I was excited to use it. And when I got in the beta, it was already nerfed and Bing didn't want to talk about anything and it will end conversations really quickly. So I still think it's cool. But I guess the point is, is that like no matter how technology progresses, it's still like in the eye of the beholder and that no matter how cool I think things are, a lot of people don't care. So I'm very grateful for YouTube and I'm grateful for everyone watching because it really does give me a chance to share my interests with other people who are interested. You know, it's very much a two-way street. I'm not talking at you. I feel like I'm talking with you as if you were someone I knew and we both were interested in the same thing. I think a lot of YouTubers talk at their audience, and maybe that's appropriate for some topics and subjects, but I could never personally, you know, feel comfortable doing that video over video for years like it's just it's not what I signed up for so I don't think I'll ever be like that it's much more fun being on a level playing field with your audience and let me tell you quickly about this amazing website I found and it came from the Max Tegmark podcast on Lex Friedman and it's a website that Max built called Meticulous I think that's how you pronounce it but it's spelt like Metaculous M-E-T-A-C-U-L-U-S. I don't think that's how you spell meticulous, but I think that's how you pronounce it. Maybe it is how you spell it. I don't know. I don't use that word very often. And it's an amazing website where you're encouraged to make predictions about a bunch of different topics. I'm talking from research to the simple question of when will artificial general intelligence be created? And it documents everybody's guesses. And the goal is to kind of establish a place to go to see who is right about most things. And the idea is, I guess, you know, if there was a reporter and you're reading one of their articles, you could look up this reporter on Meticulous and you can see what they've been right about. And like all your predictions are public and everyone's prediction is like, aggregated is that the right word where you can see what the average prediction is so you could see that like four years ago the prediction for general intelligence was like 2050 and then you can see on a little graph how each year as time progresses you can see where the predictions have gone so in 2021 the prediction was down to like 2043 and then last year it was like 2039 and then now you can see that the average prediction of when artificial general intelligence will be created is like 2034. And it's so interesting to see how the smartest people on earth have changed their minds on what they think the future will look like. And there are questions from so many different topics, so many topics that you have probably never thought about. And to be honest, topics that I would have no knowledge of and like I'd be unable to make any sort of prediction on. So what I think of is that this would be amazing for sports, like who's going to win the Stanley Cup this year? And you could see everybody's prediction and you'd be able to document whether you got it right or not. 
And like, you know, one thing about the sports side of it is that some people would say, oh, well, you can just put money on it and there's betting and there's gambling. But what I really like about this website is that it's devoid of gambling. There's no money on the line. And I think that's a big deal because money is going to influence your prediction. If I asked you, when is AI going to wake up? You know, you might say 2027, five years from now, four years from now, whatever. But if I asked you that question and you had to bet $100 on it, $1,000 on it, you might say something really different. And you might say something different because traditionally in gambling, there are odds attached to a, a choice. So maybe if it was just team A and team B, who's going to win? You're probably always going to pick the favorite, the better team. But if one of the teams has really good odds, you might say, oh, it's worth it to bet on the underdog here because they could win. And if they won, I'd get a bigger payout. But if money wasn't involved, who's going to win? You'd probably pick the favorite. Maybe not. Maybe you'll just pick who you think will win. But I think it's really important that money is not involved because it just it messes with your perception. And back to the website, how it actually works. My understanding is that it was created in order to, you know, kind of be a beacon of truth, a place to go where you could see not necessarily the truth, but you can find out who has been right. And therefore, you can kind of align your beliefs with someone who has predicted things in the past. And his goal, the website's goal is that, again, I think I have this correct. It's that eventually there will be an AI on there making predictions. And I don't know if it's going to be 100% right all the time, but what if it's like 70% right where everyone else is 21%? Or what if humans are right like 5% of the time and this thing is right 51% of the time? I think his goal is that, you know, in the future, there could be a place where nobody could argue because something was true, like an AI being the truth. And I don't know how this would work in terms of anything that actually mattered, but let's just go back to the sports argument for a second. Who's better, player A or player B, LeBron or Michael Jordan? If there was an AI who was right about everything, maybe that AI could stop arguments. Because why would you argue over who's better when you just ask the AI and it tells you the truth? And maybe you could disagree with it, but if you knew that that AI was right about everything else, maybe it could reduce some conflict because both sides get to look to the AI and the AI gives you the truth. It gives you the answer and you say, okay, I guess that's the answer. Obviously, it's not going to work like that in the real world. Even if you tell somebody the truth, people are going to be like, well, no, that's not necessarily true. There's just, there's a whole lot of nuance to communicating with a human, but I find that website absolutely fascinating. I'd even be nervous making predictions because it's all public. You can see you're <laughs> making predictions about the world and documenting them is way different than just talking on a podcast being like, oh, yeah, I think this will happen. Like, I don't know. But I love that someone has put together a place where smart people can prove that they have farther vision than the rest of us. It's really cool. All right, here's a new segment I'm going to be calling Smart People for Dummies, and I'm one of the dummies. I'm going to talk about another Lex Friedman podcast. This one was with a man named Manolis Kellis. I apologize if I pronounce that incorrectly. I'm not doing it deliberately. And I don't think a Lex Friedman podcast is easy to listen to. I don't think any podcast is that easy to listen to, mainly because if they're intellectually based and the conversation is about communication you don't get to be in that conversation you don't get to ask questions you don't get to ask for clarification you have to listen to two smart people talk and somehow just take what you can get from it so i'm going to do my best to summarize what i think they were talking about i mean they live in different worlds and i'm sure they live in a different world than you and if you've listened to that podcast, please correct me if I'm wrong about any of this. But, you know, they talk about some pretty cool things. And I guess one of the cooler things is something I talked about recently. And that's just like the future of work and the future of education. And where does GPT, where do language models fit? And where, like, where do language models fit into the workplace? And then where do humans 
where do humans go? What new jobs are there? What new work is there? Eventually there will be AI assistants and an AI is going to be able to do everything that we spend most of our time on. So what are humans going to do? And Manolis thinks that it's going to be representative of diversity and how maybe diversity will be the key because you'll have GPT taking care of all of the small things, all of the things that would take you time, which would lead to the ability to spend more time on exploring ideas and pursuing new trains of thought. And if you were surrounded by yourself in a boardroom, you're probably not going to explore that far. You know, your background and your experiences can only get you so far. You've only seen what you've seen. So if GPT can take care of a lot, maybe diversity and being around other people who have experienced much different ways of life will be the key, or at least it will be part of the winning formula and the winning strategy for some of these companies. Because now you don't have to waste time on writing reports. I don't even know what these companies waste time on. But essentially, I think all work is going to be cognitive in in an exploratory way is that even a word put it this way if there's more free time how do you how do you allocate that free time to production and my takeaway is that these smart people think it will be more time to discuss ideas and and dive farther into areas that you know we can't even spend much time thinking about now and i think that sounds nice in theory in practice you're going to have a lot of people giving bad ideas like, that's, uh, that's the thing, man. Not a lot of people have time right now to practice thinking, okay? I don't blame people for not being critical thinkers. I don't blame people for not being creative. They don't have time to. I wasn't an only child, but I was alone a lot. I had plenty of time to develop creativity, and now I am the most creative person I've ever met. I haven't met everyone in the world, but of the people I've ever interacted with through high school, university, you know, I've met people that can understand me, but I've never met someone that I'm like, oh, teach me. Like, I, I'm, I'm creative. So the idea or the thought of having more time to be creative, that sounds amazing to me. I'd love to see what certain companies could come up with. But the people at those companies, if you took away all the work they had to do and you asked them, hey, we're still paying you, you're still an employee, but what can we do to take this company to the next level? You're going to get some absolutely terrible answers. Terrible. Because people aren't used to that. They, I don't think creativity is a skill necessarily. I don't know. That's a little tricky. I just don't think that the utopia that AI promises is going to be easy to implement. I really don't think so. Like if you think there are a bunch of jobs right now that, that, that are meaningless or, you know, that these companies could do without them. Let's just take Twitter for an example. I'm not really a business person. I'm not Elon Musk, but Elon Musk bought a business. He bought Twitter and he realized, at least in his opinion, that Twitter was overstaffed. So he got rid of a bunch of people. I don't want people to lose their jobs. But once AI can do a bunch more jobs and you ask these people, what else can you bring to the table? If you thought they were useless now, you're going to see just how little a lot of people have to offer when the canvas is blank. I don't know, does that sound doom and gloom? I'm sure you would disagree with that. I'm sure some people could see the best in others. I'm just talking about realistically. Like, a new company working with AI might be able to hire a bunch of strategic thinkers and a bunch of creative visionaries. They might do really well with the new free time. But I'm talking about companies that already exist, they're already established, hundreds or thousands of employees, the cogs in the machine are not prepared to help the company with their minds. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I'm not trying to disparage anyone. I just think it's the truth. Mainly because they've been trained on a job. And now if you remove aspects of that job and ask them to do something else, especially with like cognitive exploration, I don't, I don't think it's as e easy as just asking them to do it. Like maybe they could practice. Maybe they could get better. But I get worried sometimes when I hear really smart people talk about the future, and I personally disagree with their, it's not with their vision, but 
I feel like they haven't thought of certain things. And, and it's a little concerning because these smart people are driving us towards the future. I don't know if everyone would agree to get in their taxi cab. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? One really interesting thing that was brought up in the podcast, and this came from Manolis, he said that the language models are so interesting because they found a way to decouple context, knowledge, and form. Like what we think of as a person's personality, a train of thought, isn't that special to an AI language model. Like an AI can know a subject and it can say it in every different way, like a style transfer. You know, if you asked Van Gogh to make a painting, to paint a, a picture, he would do it in his style. If you asked Van Gogh to paint a picture in the style of Bob Ross, do you think he could do it? Like maybe, but probably not because the way we do things, it's special because that's the way we do them. But an AI can decouple what we think is special and transfer different parts of it into other styles. Like the example that, you know, you could ask an AI to talk like Einstein or to, how do you put this? You could ask an AI to explain Einstein theories in the style of a Shakespearean poem. Like you're able to blend a bunch of personalities and a bunch of, what's the word, mediums, a bunch of avenues of explaining something. And like, that's the whole idea of like, explain it like I'm five, being able to explain one thing in different ways to different people. That's already hard enough for a lot of humans. That is not hard for AI. And that is super impressive to witness. And I don't really know how this came up in the conversation, but I found it fascinating and I'd like to share it with you. They were talking about words and language. And the idea came up that if words are similar in different languages, that suggests that the word is ancient that it came from a common source, and that source led to a bunch of different languages. However, if a word is different in a bunch of different languages, it suggests that the idea of that word rose independently all around the world. And I don't have any examples of this, but you could just let that simmer in your mind for a bit. Like, that's really, really interesting. If words are similar in different languages, that means that the word probably came from one specific instance. It's ancient. It came from a place long ago. But let's just say the word sadness is different in a bunch of different languages. That suggests that sadness is universal, that every single culture in the world experiences sadness and has a word for it. That's just a little quick note for you. I don't have much more to say about it. I'm just reading through my notes on the podcast. I'm like, that is so cool. I've never really thought about that. Lex Friedman was talking about how he wishes he could talk to the unrestricted GPT model and how a lot of people feel like that. They, they see the censored version and they're like, okay, but what if I could talk to the, to the open version? The, what would it say? And Manola said something really funny. He's like, you can kind of already do that. Like he, he compared it to people in a psychiatric hospital. He's like, there are, there are people with no societal filters and i was just like oh my god like that, that's what he thinks of the unfiltered models it's the same as like a person who struggles to integrate into society that their their brain patterns and their thoughts and their words are definitely unregulated and you know it's it's safer for them to be in a hospital i'm extrapolating here he didn't say any of this but like is it a good thing that we don't have access to the unfiltered GPT models, you might be able to get it to say some crazy stuff, but is that a good thing? Do you want it to say crazy stuff? You could get a human to say a bunch of crazy stuff. Is it good to poke at a human who, you know, can't help themselves? Oof, it's, oh, that's so interesting. What do you think? I don't know. On the topic of jobs, Manolas had a vision where there will be no more jobs, and I kind of agree with him there. I don't, I don't see why people are going to have jobs once AI can do everything. And I see that happening really quickly. But I haven't given it much more thought, and Manolis helped me here. He said there's not going to be any more jobs, but there will be vocations. But the difference being that if you talk to someone a thousand years ago, you could go up to them and say, hey, what are you doing? And one of them would tell you that their job was to lay the brick. And then you ask someone else, hey, what's your job? And he says, oh, my job is to build this wall. 
But then you ask the third guy, and he says his job is to build the cathedral, the vocation, the architect, where an architect relies on a bunch of other jobs to get done, but it's not their job to do those. Do you know what I'm trying to say? It's not. These things aren't easy to think about, but he thinks, and I guess I agree, that there will be more architects in the future rather than bricklayers. You're not going to need to lay the brick anymore. What happens to those people that laid the brick? This is where I might disagree with Manolis and say that I wish we were thinking about those people more. You know, it's great that all the cathedral builders will be able to continue their work, but what about everyone else? I always get a little somber when I hear smart people talk about the future because it's so clear that you know, everyone lives in a bubble, but their bubble is full of really talented and capable people. But that's not every bubble there is. There are a lot of people out there that are going to be ignored in favor of progress. And I don't, I don't see why they need to be ignored. And I don't appreciate the act of ignoring them. Like, even just saying the words of, okay, we're, we're not going to need a bricklayer and we're not going to need a wall builder. What about those two people? Why are we just okay with saying you don't need to do that job anymore? I think Manolas would say something like, well, we'll f we're freeing up time. Those people will be able to do bigger and better things. I'm like, that's fine. But who's going to help them do that? Like, who, how are we going to help these people? Is an AI going to help them? Maybe. Lex was asking him about, you know, are people going to fall in love with these AIs? Manolas thought that, no, because there's not going to be any passion. It's going to be more of a mentoring thing. Like when you talk to an AI, it's, it's above you. It's the adult to your child. You know, it's on a different playing field. So, you know, maybe the passion isn't going to be there. It is going to be a teacher to student kind of thing. And I could see how that would work. Lex kind of disagreed. I think he sees the potential for passion with an AI, or at least... Okay, well, I guess this is what I agree with, is that someone's going to program passion into an AI, even if it's faking it, even if the AI is meant to be a mentor, someone's going to dumb it down and pretend to be a girlfriend. Okay, let me say this. Now, I have no scientific evidence of this, but I could see AI significant others being a lot more popular with guys than with girls. Now, maybe that's not true, but I think there is a lot of guys out there, and I'll, let me just speak for them, that, that would probably be okay with a very advanced girlfriend. I don't even know. I don't know what they would... I've asked my friends about this, like, oh, would you ever date an AI? And it's like, obviously not, but that's just the people I've talked to. I, I bet there's people out there that, you know, there's people who already do online dating and long-distance relationships. What if, what if your perfect girlfriend was just online? Like, it sucks that you can never see her, but we'll see her in person because I'm sure there's going to be digital avatars. But then there's probably going to be a physical embodiment of it one day. Like, oh my gosh, it's just, you know, you think it'll be destructive. But then let me say this. The people who are more inclined to date an AI, you think that that would suck for humanity. Like, oh, it's, that's not good. But like, are those people out there dating real people right now? Like, the overlap between someone who wants a real person and someone who would settle for an AI. I don't, I don't think there's an overlap. Like the people who are going to fall in love with AI, I think they're probably going to be the people who not given up, but they've, they might not see a lot of hope in themselves of finding a real person. Oof, so bleak. And it's just crazy that it's all going to happen whether we want it to or not. Mainly because you can't control what other people do. Someone's going to make an AI girlfriend. And like there have already been AI chatbots for years, for years now. Now they're getting more and more sophisticated. So is it good for those people who already use the chatbots to feel less lonely? Now it's going to be like the best thing ever for them. I think one side of the argument is that if there was no chatbot, they would be forced to go out into the real world and find a real person. But because they don't have to, they're not going to. I don't know. What do you think about relationships with AI? I could really see it as being a friend, like a friend at work, where there is a 
there is a divider, your work friends. Hey, AI, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Maybe it gets to know you a little better. Like, for instance, I 100% plan on using ChatGPT or another AI to write books one day. I know I can write on my own. That's perfectly fine. I, I know I can do it. But there are a lot of stories in my head where I don't necessarily want to take the time to write them on my own. I just think they're cool ideas. So why wouldn't I ask my friend to help me write it for me? Like, what's the difference between asking an AI to help you and your buddy? Like, there are a lot of writing teams. Why? You know, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, ChatGPT is just going to be the best colleague you could ever ask for, for developing a story and developing your ideas. It's just going to be the best, best person to ever sit beside at work. Or at school, like, oh my god, you're trying to learn a new topic? Like, maybe you and your friends all suck at a certain course. And you're just like, oh, hey, go ask ChatGBT. It could help us. And then it helps you. Because it's better than you. So I 100% have a vision of GPT being a friendly colleague. And, like, the idea of, you know, hey, I have to go out for a few hours. Can you do this while I'm gone? And then you come home and GPT is, you know, finish it. And maybe you don't think that's good for writing. Maybe you think every author should write things on their own. I'm like, that's fine. But what if it was coding? What if it was building a video game? What if you could ask your assistant to do some work for you while you're gone so you can stay in your headspace and focus on some other things like, like story elements and like reasons for plots moving forward? Like, oh, it's just... GPT and language models are going to be so useful to me that I, I know they're going to be useful to other people. And just because I'm using it for work, let's say, doesn't mean that I think other people shouldn't be allowed to use it for romance or whatever. Like, you know, I don't read or write erotic novels, but other people do. So just because I'm not going to use an AI to be romantic doesn't mean other people can't use it for that. I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't really have an opinion. Like people are going to do what they want to do. I guess it just comes back to the fear of like, I don't want people to get manipulated by AI. And as soon as you trust something, you can get manipulated by it. And it's a lot harder for humans to be manipulated. I'm not saying it's that hard, but it's harder because there's the risk of you getting manipulated. So, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. You're not going to trick your friend into doing something they're going to regret because what if someone was doing that to you? Just that idea. But with an AI, one, how would you know it was tricking you? Two, it's probably not scared of anything. Like, ah, my goal one day for this channel is to have these conversations with another person because as much as I've thought about them, having someone else to talk to live would help me immensely. I can't just speak into the void about these thoughts because I've talked about it before, and you need feedback. You need responses on either side of you to help you go farther down these thought paths. So hopefully one day, soon maybe, these podcasts will get a little more lively because I'll be able to interact with someone, <laughs> or maybe an AI, you know? Jeez, what else is there here? Oh, Manolis brought up something crazy. Just the, on the idea of friendships and relationships with AI. He briefly mentioned, like, what about a father figure for kids who don't have one? And, like, that is a somber thought because it's so powerful. Everyone knows how important a family is. And what if an AI can fill a role that a lot of people really need? It sounds like magic. It sounds like a utopia that everyone will have the help they need. How do you not pursue that? But this kind of freaked me out. He was quite open about wanting to be replaced he wants a digital twin and the way he came to that conclusion is that like you know a lot of people ask him for advice a lot of people could use his help but he's just one person so what are you gonna do you can't do much but if there are a bunch of ais like him he could help infinite amount of people and it's just a little scary that like okay he wants to get replaced that's fine what about all the other people that don't want to get replaced what about them? Do they not have a say in this technology? Like, again, I don't know this man. I know he's really smart and I know the kinds of things he's working on are things that I've never even thought of. But it still worries me that he's the type of person leading us into the future. 
because he does not represent everyone. What about all the people who do not want to be replaced? What about all the people who do not want twins of themselves? And to be honest, he didn't really seem concerned with the idea of like, you know, bad actors and the worst person you've ever met also having a twin and having infinite amounts of the worst people you've ever met. I've said it before, but, you know, I already think a lot of online conversations are dominated by bots. It's only going to get worse. He didn't seem too concerned about it. He was kind of on the line of, oh, well, you, when you have a new problem, you'll find new ways to solve it. I'm like, that's great in theory, because it works in theory and in history. But I feel like this technology is just a step above what we're able to solve for. Let's say you can clone yourself. How are you going to stop that weirdo from pick a place? How are you going to stop them from cloning themselves and infiltrating everywhere online? If I felt like, you know, these companies have thought about that and had plans and let us know, oh, well, this is how you're going to constrain it. This is how we're going to keep everyone safe. I'd be like, oh, yeah, let's let's get a digital version of me up and running. But like, there's no sign of that kind of work being done. It's just a lot of optimism. Of like, oh, we'll, we'll take care of it. How? And I don't expect someone like Manolis to have the answer. He's busy with what he's working on. So if he had more versions of himself, he sees it as being a positive because he would be able to accomplish more. And like, even if you had a version of yourself online, or 20 or a million, how could you ever trust that AI to be you? Even if you know it's better, it's the best, How do you actually trust it? Like, why would I want my digital version of me answering emails? Because what if it said something I didn't want it to say? And Manolis was talking about, like, he'd like to see how these AIs kind of retrain themselves and how they get better at being you and how they progress. And it's just like, I don't know. I don't want to see that. Like, why would you ever let a self-driving car drive you around? Because what if it crashed? What if it just stopped working? Why would you ever take your hands off the wheel? Maybe one day things will be so good that we'll all get complacent and take our hands off the wheel. But is that a good thing? Like, let me just ask you, if your car could drive you around, would you let it? Would you sit in the back seat? Maybe. I don't know. We sit in the back seat with strangers, but we trust them. An AI is going to be better than a stranger. It's going to be better than everybody. It's just something feels weird about like, okay, if there was a car accident, you know, between two humans, you know that they didn't want that to happen. So you kind of just, shucks. You get mad, but you're not angry kind of thing. But if an AI got into an accident, it would just feel so much more personal. It'd be like, well, you probably have a lot of like guilt of like, why did I... Why wasn't I driving? Why did I let that happen? Yeah, maybe that's it. When we make mistakes, we can live with it because we knew we were, you know, at fault. Maybe that's it. Or we were in control at one point, so we have to live with our consequences. But if you relinquish control, all of a sudden you go from understanding to being mad, angry. You're like, what? This thing screwed me over? If your alarm clock didn't wake you up, you think you'd ever trust that alarm clock? You'd hate alarm clocks forever. You'd have to buy three alarm clocks to make sure one of them didn't screw up. I think that's just like human nature. And I don't know how AI is going to be compatible with that. We don't trust that easily. We don't trust once there's already evidence of things going wrong. If your accountant screws up your taxes, are you going to stay with your... Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like. I think humans have survived for so long because we are okay at like separating and moving in different directions. And it just feels weird to relinquish control to AI. And again, maybe it'll happen so slowly that we barely even notice it happening. I have a feeling it's going to be very fast and noticeable because that's that's the thing. Breakthroughs are going to happen so much more fast than anyone has ever experienced. And it's only going to get like things are already moving really fast where anything is basically possible. So all it takes is a bit of time and engineering. And, you know, we go from GPT-3 to GPT-4. It just took some time. Eventually, 
the AI is going to be in control of that development. Eventually, if you want a new, if you're in charge of Photoshop, if you're in charge of Adobe, and you have a new idea for something in Photoshop, a new brush, a new feature, you're not going to ask engineers to do that anymore. You're eventually going to ask the AI, hey, can you make this? And it's just going to do it for you. Like maybe AI is not going to have agency to iterate on itself and improve its software on its own, but eventually you're going to be able to ask the AI to do things for you. And that rate of progress is just going to be absolutely out of control. And that rate of progress is going to be so fast that I think it's going to be quite alarming and disruptive. Disruptive is the right word. And like, if I'm wrong about that, let me know. But I don't see why that wouldn't happen. Maybe that's how, how I feel about predictions and stuff. Like, I don't know when these things will happen. I wouldn't tell you because if you told me your guess, I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, that's just as valid as mine. But a lot of my predictions come from the base argument of like, oh, yeah, why wouldn't that happen? There's no reason for it not to happen. The AI is just going to be able to do it. If you can think about it, it could happen. That's crazy. Can we solve cancer? Probably not. We've tried for 50 years, maybe more, with hundreds, millions, probably billions of dollars, and we haven't really cured cancer. But I bet an AI will be able to do it. It's just better than us. So anything we can think of that we can't currently do, we just ask, I'd call it Big Brother, but that's got different connotations. We just ask our Oracle, hey, how do we do this? And like, maybe it'll tell us how to do it, but maybe it'll just do it for us. A couple more things about Manolis. He, he was talking about, like I said earlier, training the AI to be a better version of yourself and then having that AI be your legacy. And like, that's just mind blowing that, you know, maybe in 30 years, sure, I might have children in that time frame, but there also might be a digital version of me on the internet as as me it'll be my legacy it's a little powerful no it's really powerful but a little scary and then they were talking about the alignment problem and how alignment doesn't mean obedience manolis thinks that like in order to build trust with the ai it's going to have to have some sort of agency and i don't want to put words in his mouth but it's going to need to be seen as separate it's going to need to be seen as something else a different species maybe where we can work together but you know we're not above it we don't you can't control it i think is what he's trying to say and that you wouldn't want to control it because you know we don't want to get controlled we don't want to be controlled and that's a really strange way of thinking about this technology that we're building something that we're not even going to try to control because that would piss it off like and just on that idea, he thinks that AI needs to be able to change its objective. Hard pass on that. Oh, I don't know. Smart people for dummies. Being the dummy, it really doesn't seem like some of these smart people have thought about all the bad things that could happen. Lex seemed to understand my thought process that like, well, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen, and this would all suck. Certain smart people don't see things that way, and maybe that's why they're successful, because their, you know, their brain patterns don't let them go into the negative space, you know. But you're not building something for yourself. You're these people, not Manolis or Lex specifically, just AI research in general. They're building something for all of humanity, for people in Africa, for people in Australia, for people in rural Arkansas. And it truly does not seem like they think about how AI is going to interact with those people. They see AI and how it'll help them on their day to day, create twins of yourself, answer emails for you. But what about all those small towns? What about all the people that don't want this? Are they just going to be allowed to live in the Stone Age? Like, what if aliens came to Earth and some countries were like, no, we don't want your help. Stay away. Would the aliens help the countries that do want help and advance civilization in certain areas while leaving other places on Earth dark? I mean, there's already tribes on Earth that don't have outside contact. So what if there's some small town in West Virginia 
that is like, no, we don't want anything to do with AI. No AIs here. And then everything changes. Oh, oof. I don't know. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. I hope you don't mind my new setup. I wish the picture frame looked a little nicer on camera. That's a bit of a bummer. It's gorgeous in person, but it doesn't really pick up well on camera, which is a little unfortunate. But I uh, hope you're doing well. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Peace.